ہم ذکر صاحب جی سام ذکر صاحب نے ان کو ریڈیوز کرنا ہاں ٹھیک یو شوڈ بی ڈن بائی حافظ سمیع اللہ چودھری حافظ سمیع اللہ چودھری اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم للہ ما فی السماوات و ما فی الارض وَإِن تُبْدُوا مَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ أَوْ تُخْفُوهُ يُحَاسِبْكُمْ بِهِ اللَّهِ فَيَغْفِرُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيُعَظِّبُ مَنْ موسیقی موسیقی وَقَالُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا غُفْرَانَكَ رَبَّنَا وَإِلَيْكَ الْمَصِيرِ لَا يُكَلِّفُ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا اللہ وسہا لہا ما کسبت و علیہا ما کسبت ربنا لا تواخذنا ان نسینا او اختانا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا اسرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولا انت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين
Jazakumullah. Now the translation of these verses will be read by Tariq Sharif. Tariq Sharif, please. To Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth. And whether you disclose what is in your minds or keep it hidden, Allah will call you to account for it. Then will he forgive whomsoever he pleases and punish whomsoever he pleases. And Allah has the power to do all that he wills. This messenger of ours believes in that which has been revealed to him from his Lord. And so do the believers. All of them believe in Allah and in his angels and in his books and in his messengers saying, we make no distinction between any of his messengers. And they say, we hear and we obey. We implore thy forgiveness, O our Lord, and to thee is the returning. Allah burdens not any soul beyond its capacity. It shall have the reward it earns, and it shall get the punishment that it incurs. Our Lord, do not punish us if we forget or fall into error. And our Lord, lay not on us a responsibility as thou didst lay upon those before us. Our Lord, burden us not with what we have not the strength to bear, and efface our sins, and grant us forgiveness, and have mercy on us. Thou art our master, so help us now against the disbelieving people. Thank you. Jazakumullah. Now, a poem by Hazrat Muslim Salaam, the founder of the Ahmadiyya community, would be read by Zafar Ahmed Sarwar, not all the poem perhaps, but some selected verses. Bahar aai hai Is waqt e khidam e Bahar aai hai Is waqt e khidam e लगे हैं फूल मेरे बोसामे लगे हैं फूल मेरे बोसामे मलाहत है अजब इस दिल सितामे मलाहत है अजब इस दिल सितामे हुए बदनाम हम इस से जहाँ में हुए बदनाम हम इस से जहाँ में उदू जब बढ़ गया शोरों फुगाम दो जब बढ़ गया शोरों फुगामे नेहा हम हो गए प्यारे नेहा में नेहा हम हो गए यारे नेहामे हुआ मुझ पर वो जाहिर मेरा हादीम हुआ मुझ पर वो जाहिर 
मेरा हादीम पसुबहानजीम अफजल्लादीम पसुबहानजीम अफजल्लादीम बहार आई है इस वक्त खिजामे लगे हैं फूल मेरे बोस्ता में करूं क्यों कर अदा मैं शुक्र बारी करूं क्यों कर अदा मैं शुक्र बारी फिदा हो उसकी राह में उम्र सारी फिदा हो उसकी राह में उम्र सारी मेरे सर पर है मिन्नत उसकी भारी चले उस हाथ से कश्ती हमारी मेरी बिगड़ी हुई उसने बना दी मेरी बिगड़ी हुई उसने बना दी पसुबहान लजीम अफजल्लादीम पसुबहान लजीम अफजल्लादीम बहार आई है इस वक्त खिजामे लगे हैं फूल मेरे बोस्ता में तुझे हम दो सनाम जेबा है प्यारे तुझे हम दो सनाम जेबा है प्यारे के तूने काम सब मेरे सवारे तेरे एहसान मेरे सर पर हैं भारे चमकते हैं वो सब जैसे सितारे गढ़े में तूने सब दुश्मन उतारे गढ़े में तूने सब दुश्मन उतारे हमारे कर दिए ऊंचे मनारे हमारे कर दिए ऊंचे मुकाबिल में मेरे ये लोग हारे कहाँ मरते थे पर तूने ही मारे कहाँ मरते थे पर तूने ही मारे 
शरीरों पर पड़े उनके शरारे न उनसे रुक सके मकसद हमारे उन्हें मातम हमारे घर में शादी उन्हें मातम हमारे घर में शादी पशुबहान अखजल्लादी पशुबहान अखजल्लादी बाहर आई है इस वक्त खिला में लगे हैं फूल मेरे बोसा में तुझे सब जोर कुदरत है खुदाया तुझे पाया हर एक मतलब को पाया हर एक आशिक ने है एक बुत बनाया हमारे दिल में ये दिल भर समाया वही आराम जाम और दिल को भाया वही जिसको कहे रबुल बराया हुआ जाहिर वो मुझ पर बिल्लया हुआ जाहिर वो मुझ पर बिल्लया पशुबहान अखजल्लादी पशुबहान अखजल्लादी बाहर आई है इस वक्त खिदाम लगे हैं फूल मेरे बोसामे Now the translation of the verse just recited before you would be done by Umar Bilal Ibrahim. Umar Bilal. Right. 
ravishing beauty has stolen my heart and I am infamous in the world for my love's sake when my enemy exceeded in his platter and cry. I hide myself in the friend who is hidden from my the eye. He is my guide. Manifest himself to me. He is holy indeed who draws my foe. How can I think, my Lord, the most high God My whole life is ready to be sacrificed in his way. The weight of his favor upon me is enormous his ways the only hand who help my ship to sail He helped and restored my affairs. Oh, my beloved God, you are fitting for all the prayers, praise, and glory. You have set my affairs right. I'm completely overwhelmed by your benevolence. Your favors conferred on me are shining like stars. You drown all my foes in the deep and raise the heavens high all our merits of fame and success. Oh, my oppressor, 
us God vanquish before my eyes. They were hard to die, but you killed them yourselves. The flame of mischief fire lit by them fell back on their heads to scorch them. They failed to stop us from reaching our goals. Now the sadness sits heavily on their hearts. And our house is filled with bliss and happiness. Holy is he who has punished my foes. My Lord, all power belongs to you. All our hearts desire everyone else holds an idol to love, <clears throat> but my heart is captivated. Only my beloved God. He is my heart's content, my true love. He is the one of all. He manifested himself to me, becoming my help. He is holy who thrashes my foes. Now I request uh, Dr. Sandra Zephyr to introduce our guest of honor, Council Member Isaiah Leggett. Dr. Sandra Zephyr, please. Mr. Isaiah Leggett is a man of many accomplishments. He is a decorated Vietnam War hero, a patriot, and a distinguished public servant. Mr. Leggett is the first 
African American to be elected to the Montgomery County Council. He is a recipient of many awards, including the Distinguished Military Graduate in 1967, magna cum laude from Harvard University Law School. He has also served as a White House Fellow. Ike Leggett, as he likes to be called by his friends, is very active in community service, serving on the boards of many organizations. He is also a member of the bars of the Supreme Courts of Iowa, Pennsylvania, and Louisiana, as well as the District Court of Appeals. Without further ado, I have the distinct privilege to introduce to you Mr. Isaiah Leggett. Good morning, Your Holiness. Welcome again to Montgomery County and welcome again to Maryland. I noted last year when you were here that we had inclement weather and it was raining. This year it's a little bit warmer than usual for this time of the year. But any time that you are in our presence, it is a lovely day and I thank you again for returning and I thank you again for blessing us here in Montgomery County, Maryland. Thank you. We have a well open arms for all of you. But as I indicated some time in the past, there are some within the community who have taken exception to the growth and the development of houses of worship in all forms of religious institutions. You, however, are a model. I note that you've expressed a willingness to work with all facets of our community. You have integrated well within this community to ensure that traffic, safety, and all of the things that in otherwise would impact our neighbors are in fact in good order. But I say that as we look across this county of Montgomery County, and we are in many ways well, well diverse in a number of houses of worship, there are some challenges that we face because we are now facing within our own legislative battles a challenge that would in effect in the future severely restrict all forms of worship in Montgomery County by the restriction of the development and the expansions of houses of worship. I think that it is wrong and I urge you with the model and example that you have shown for all of Montgomery County, in fact, for all of Maryland, to join with me and others in repealing and rejecting these ordinances that would, in effect, make it very, very difficult for the future growth and development of all forms of worship in Montgomery County. I know that it can be done. I know that it can be done because you have set the example for all forms of worship in this county. I welcome you here. I think the citizens of Montgomery County are proud as a group to have you here to worship with us in your 49th anniversary. I pledge and I pray that as we look to the future that we will see an even greater expansion, a greater display of love. Because as I note for the sign in the back, it says very clearly and very proudly, love for all hatred for none. That is a model and example for all citizens of this county and all citizens of the state of Maryland. Your Holiness, once again, welcome to Montgomery County. Thank you.
وَعَدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم سبعات الذين نمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا ادعو الى سبيل ربك بالحكمه والموعظه الحسنه وجادلهم بالتي هي احسن ان ربك هو اعلم بمن ضل عن سبيله وهو عالم بالمتدين to our guest of honor, council member Isaiah Leggett, for welcoming, welcoming me and the entire Jamaat Ahmadiyya with such warm words of encouragement, welcoming us with open arms to America and welcoming us to convey our message of peace, which is universal in this character, to all the people of America. I know the honorable guest personally as well, we have met before, and uh, let me say just this much about him, that more one knows of him, the more one loves him for that. He's a fun, beautiful specimen of a human, of a human in America. I hope his human image spreads all over America and overwhelms it with humanity. That's all I have to say in response to that wonderful message of welcome presented to us by Mr. or shall I say just council member Isaiah Leggett. The purpose of this session in fact is summarized in my last concluding address. And I'll go straight into the subject of this discussion, which I've chosen for this afternoon or pre-noon, whatever the time be. But this is going to be the concluding message of the whole session, of the whole Jalsa or Annual Conference of the United States. And I hope you'll remember this message not only till next year, but the years after, until your life. Until your life ends and you are called back by God, that's what I mean, is important because this is the central message of propagation of truth in the Holy Quran, which is 
essential for every Muslim who believes in the Holy Prophet of Islam and is being a true messenger of Allah. It's not just uh, optional for a Muslim to preach. It's incumbent upon every Muslim. It's essential for every Muslim to preach to others the message of truth. But when you speak of this preaching purpose, many problems arise out of this. Why should the Muslims have a right to preach to others their message while all the people of various religious denominations would require the same right to preach? Could it not create disorder in the society in the name of one God, or as others believe, in the name of many gods, what would be the purpose of this preaching which is prescribed by Islam for every Muslim to be essential? It is this issue which I would like first of all to explain in the light of the verses of the Quran which I have specifically chosen for this purpose. Pro preaching or propagation is, first of all, the fundamental right of humans. This right is extended to humans in all fields of their occupation. What is politics? If there is no right of propagation of political ideas in the society, extended to all the components of the society. If equal rights are extended to all, then the disorder removes. But what is the manner of propagation? That is the second point. In politics, if people take to arms for spreading their message, the human society everywhere would condemn it and rule it out as a, as a part of the game of politics. They would not be permitted to take arms in matter of persuasion which has to be the persuasion, persuasion through arguments, not a sort of persuasion through arms. Now this also extends to religion. If any religion believes in propagation of its ideas through, through recourse to arms, it should be condemned there and then. It is the responsibility of the human society the universal human society, to condemn all such attempts. And as far as the Quranic concept of inviting to Islam is concerned, this is expressed in the, verses which I have, in the verse which I have just read, and I'll explain this bit by bit so that every Muslim and also every non-Muslim understand the purpose of propagation as presented by the Quran. First of all, as far as the religion propagation, religious propagation is concerned, it does not relate to the number of people who are converted at all. The number just does not matter in matters of religious propagation. What is the purpose then? Why do we preach if we do not want to increase our number? In this verse, which I have just recited, this purpose is described, which is, Udo ila sabi'il rabbika bil hikmati wal Invite to the path of thy Lord. Now this is the purpose of religious propagation. Any religion which deviates from this purpose would lose the entitlement to propagate in the name of God. The beauty of this verse is such as cannot be denied by any believer in anything in the world. If you invite to the ways of God, where is a human being who could object to this invitation to the creation of Allah? So here the verse does not allow you or does not invite you to propagate for converting people to Islam as you understand it. It admonishes you 
to invite people to the path of Allah, the path, every path which leads to Him. And this subject in itself is not controversial. While if it was said instead that you should preach to your concept of Islam and invite people to your own belief of Islam as you hold it, then the moment you say, say it, the split would begin, begin and uh, fight, infight between Muslims and Muslims will start. Because Islam is not a concept which is unanimously held by all the sex, all the sex in Islam. So if the Quran had said only invite to your understanding of what you believe Islam to be, there would be the beginning of disruption and chaos. Because then each of the Muslims would be inviting mankind to his understanding of Islam, which would be so different that it could be fundamentally opposed to the understanding of Islam by the followers of other sects. So I'll specifically speak of the movement of preaching as explained in this verse and explain the meaning of this verse further so that everyone in the world can understand it to be a universal message in its own right. Udo ila sabil rabbika. What is the sabil of Rabb? What is the path of God? Every path which leads to Him is the sabil of God. And every effort to, to make people realize that they must join God in this life or in the life after death. But it's better for them to reach Him and to commune with Him before they're called back. And what is the path? When you begin to define it, you have to realize that the path of God or the path leading to God has to be the path of His attributes. So invite the mankind to the attributes of God. This is the central message of this verse, which must be strictly followed and adhered to. But how can you invite? The Holy Quran says, Bil hikmate wal mawaizatil hasana. There are just two instruments permitted to the Muslims for use in the way of their struggle for the godliness. These two instruments are hikmah, wisdom. It doesn't say sword, it doesn't say bullets, it doesn't mention any arms, material arms in this respect. The only instrument provided to the Muslims to wage this holy war, and this is holy war, are two, as mentioned in this verse, bil hikmati wal mu'izatil hasana. With wisdom and a goodly word. Now, if you approach others and invite them to the path of Allah, which is the path of his attributes, and do it with wisdom, what objection can humanity have against this? Whatever objection can humanity have against it? None whatsoever. Who would object to your inviting to the attributes of Allah while you do it with wisdom? Now the wisdom requires the appropriateness of the, of, of the R of your invitation. Propriety is central to wisdom. If you invite people to the path of Allah by knocking at their doors or throwing in some pamphlet, I don't think this is wisdom because so many people do it, even the commercial agents do the same thing. And people look down at this habit as something of the advantage of those who do it, not 
something which is of their own advantage. So the first requirement of wisdom is that the person to whom you deliver this message of God should consider it to be a thing of his advantage to whom the message is delivered. Or he will show scant interest in your effort or even look down upon it or may even turn against you. If he knows the purpose to be selfish, he would simply not be interested. This is the first requirement of wisdom. So if the people of America believe that the Ahmadis, by making us convert to their faith, only intend to increase their influence over the society, only tend to increase their bodily weight, and that's all there is to it. Wisdom would reject this and the wisdom of the people and every man is provided with a central system of wisdom by, man, by God, would reject this effort and would not be interested in the message itself because it is the purpose of the message which humans first define or analyze. If the purpose is selfish, they are not interested in what follows. So it is here that I draw the attention of the American Ahmadis to be very careful in approaching the non-Muslims around them in a manner that they should not receive the slightest impression that what you are doing is is only for the sake of your own aggrandizement for only increasing your body weight. This can be better understood, this part of the wisdom, in relation to the human system of assimilation of food and turning it into a part of the live human system. This system of assimilation is not specific to humans. This system of assimilation is common to life. Whatever can be defined as life, the system of assimilation would also be shared by that specimen of life, life. But there are differences between life and life. There is life which is of a higher order. The higher the order of life is, it is required that the food which is intake for the body to assimilate has to be more purified and healthier. So when you talk of the ways of God, the people you assimilate have to be pure or there, is a, there has to be a system of purifying them before they are assimilated. This aspect of my address can be better understand, understood when enlarged with relation to human experience of assimilation and that of life as well. In preliminary life, what we consider filth and toxin and detrimental elements of assimilation are not looked upon that, upon that food as such by the animal which assimilates it. There are amoebas, there are other small organisms which uh, are so numerous that they become in uncountable. But they are more numerous in the filth, not in the healthy food. If humans try that, then they will know the meaning of assimilation. For the assimilation, you must first of all purify the food if the, if the station of the person or the people or I, mean, I should say specimens of life for whose advantage you are assimilating the surrounding thing, if that status of life is higher, the greater would be the need for attending to the 
to the purification of food as intake. This is why in humans it is all the more essential, it is most essential. The refuse of the humans is eaten up without the least damage by other lower forms of animals. And the humans can be distinguished, distinguished from the rest of life just by this single criterion that their food intake has, intake has to be pure and healthy and better purified. The things you throw out of which you can't even imagine bringing closer to your mouth or to your noses are relished by the life around you. And these things do no damage to them. So if an Ahmadi realizes what he is calling the society for, he will realize that in religious uh, entity, in religious entities, the entity of calling towards the path of Allah is the highest of, highest in its uh, level of existence and purest in its form. Anything contrary to this would damage those who absorb others in the name of Allah or in the path of God. So they must be very choosy and critical in assimilating the part of the society into a system if they believe it is healthy and pure and advanced in its uh, level of uh, occupation, uh, its level of degree in the sense that as humans are most advanced by comparison to other forms of life, in human occupation the system of inviting to the path of Allah has to be taken as the most advanced. So its station would be the highest as comparison to all other efforts to call to the path of Allah. If you are genuine, then you must care for the purity of the intake. And I expect Ahmadis to be genuine. That is why we have rejected all efforts to increase our number by inviting such people who when assimilated would destroy our system. If you try to increase the body weight by assimilating such things as a detrimental to the health of the body, whatever results is not what you require, is not your objective in life. It may even destroy whatever you possess. So the most important thing in my sight is the quality of the life of Ahmadis. If they are truly dedicated to God, this quality must be preserved. And all attempts to increase the number at the cost of this quality must be rejected outright. And this is the history of Ahmadiyyat in America. Right from the beginning, we were tempted to adopt certain ways by which we could attract a, a large section of American society to the message of Ahmadiyya if we compromised in our values. If we sacrificed some of our values, there were many who would readily join us. According to authentic historians, the black movement of Islam in America was initially started by the message of Islam through Ahmadiyya. A stage came when the parting of the ways began on this issue which I am just describing to you. They wanted Islam to be used for gaining some sectarian, sectarian parochial purposes as against the rest of the American society. It was this which was rejected. And it was this for which Ahmadiyyat was rejected by the large number of those people. They came and went out the other way because it did not suit their purpose. 
and they did not suit our purpose. Because we are for the quality, not for the number. We knew that they would harm the path of God or the objective of inviting people to the path of God if they introduced their own parochial ends and objectives into this healthy system of inviting the path of God. Why do I say that? What right I have to say that their path was detrimental or opposed to the path of God. Because the Holy Quran says, Udo Elasibire Rabbika. Rabb is Rabbul Alameen. His paths are common to all his creation. His paths are shared by all the humanity. So if your understanding of God's path clashes with this fundamental principle of commonality, of God's path with all the humans, then they have to be wrong. And the Quran has to be right. So we prefer the Quranic teaching over, our, over any ulterior motives of aggrandizement, so none in America can blame us for selfishness. The most important factor which begins to reject a message is the realization that the people who are selling these commodities are selfish. They are doing it for only for their own commercial gains. But I have demonstrated to you. Amadeus had no commercial gains in sight. It rejected that bending to the path of humans. The bending of the path of God, for the sake of humans, I mean, we rejected that out outright, and we reject it even today. So you must stick to the paths of God, which, as I explained, are the paths of his attributes. What are those paths? There's so many. But only briefly I can introduce a few to you, which you must introduce to the society. But what, for what sake? For the sake of reformation. For the sake of improving the quality of this society. If you stick to this value, adhere to it fast, at every possible cost, then you are bound to emerge victorious ultimately. Otherwise, if you begin to compromise, you have already failed. You are not worthy of anything. So, if I explain further, let me make you realize that there is more unrest growing in American society in every level of human occupation. America talks peace and cannot demonstrate peace within itself. This is the tragedy or irony of American situation, which I do not criticize for the sake of condemnation. I criticize only for the sake of making clear your objective in life in America, of life in America. All such factors which separate American society from other parts of American society are not paths leading to God. All such factors which create a barrier between man and man and woman and woman. All such factors which create barriers between classes of American society and other classes of American society. Which do not collectively lead the Americans to a single path which would lead to God. Or lead to the concept of humanity under one God whose unity demands that we must also be unified under the influence of that unity. So this is the most important thing which should be apparent to everybody here. That the society, American society needs such people who give a call for the unity of God, not living somewhere in the heavens, in the loftiness of heavenly chambers but which comes down to earth and influences the humans and makes them unified. 
if you cannot unify America, how can you unify the entire world by the politics which grows from your disunification? This is the most central issue to which we must address all our attention. And the beauty of this system is then when, that when you preach goodness for the sake of goodness and you spend your efforts in promoting the cause of goodness, the society, even if it rejects you, respects you. It does not hate you. And if it does, then it's entirely given over to devil and nothing of it is for God. So if such people reject your efforts of goodness, which, unanim which according to the universal concept of goodness are good, if a section of the society rejects it and treats you with hatred, don't let them dissuade you from pursuing the path. This is the second message which I must deliver in the course of this admonishment. Remember that you should try to improve the quality of life all around you. Remember that that was the occupation of all the prophets of God, even before they were made into prophets of God. Read the history of the, of the prophets of Allah or the messengers of Allah all over the world. Before the day when God told them to represent God himself, they became popular only because they were the champions of goodness. They were the ushers of goodness into the society which had rejected goodness in general, in all pursuits, in all human pursuits. And as long as they did not declare themselves to be the representative of God, they were not hated. They were the more respected for that. Take the case of Saleh, a prophet of God who is mentioned also in the Bible. As long as he did not declare that he was offici not officiating but representing humbly God the Creator and inviting the people of God, people of people of God, the same God, I mean, to his path, he was highly respected. And that is what the Holy Quran tells us: that at the moment of his declaration, the elders of the of the of the nation came to him and said, look here, Saleh, you before this claim was one of, you, not one, but was the most highly respected by the people. But madness has uh, captured your, 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 but madness has captured you that you abandon all this popularity for the sake of an idea which to us is high-flown, which does not exist in reality. And from there, the hatred of Hazrat Saleh and what he stood for began. So despite the fact that the, to begin with, the idea of spreading the virtues of God's attributes seems to be so innocent and simple. As you advance further, it becomes more complicated. And for the same, same reason, people begin to hate you. But only when you seriously throw a challenge to the society that you're going to take over. You're going to transform the character of the society. For Ahmadis, I tell that they should, to Ahmadis, I tell that they should wait till that moment. At present, all the roads to your calling towards God are clear. There are no stone pelting people around you. But when you progress further, when the society of America would be reformed in the name of God, 
in areas of goodness, this would certainly create the same reaction as always was created against all Pavitra Mahatma. But only you have to rise to a position of challenge, not a verbal challenge like the challenge of a duel or throwing of glass, a challenge in the sense that the society begins to realize that these people are bound to overcome us. They are bound to emerge victorious. And because the society loves its evil ways, that is the reason why they join hands to oppose such movements of morality. If you do overmuch of morality with drug smugglers, you may, as a return, be shot dead by them, not because you are pursuing goodness, but because your goodness opposes their evil. And one of the two must survive. So, the opposition which you are going to confront in this society is not at all your fault. It is the fault of the society, which will emerge and take over the command of the social attitude to you when you really pose a threat to the society in the name of goodness. I draw your attention to further clarify this point with, uh, to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. I draw your attention to Jesus Christ because I know this society is overwhelmingly Christian. They will understand things better. When Jesus started his movement of preaching goodness, he did not wait till the revelation of God which appointed him to do so. Right from his childhood, childhood, he was given to goodness. That is the reason why the Holy Quran speaks of a child Jesus who even in his cradle spoke of goodness. He did not wait for the prophethood to come to an adult Jesus. He began right from his childhood, the preaching of goodness all around. And it was not rejected by society as such. It did not create any negative reaction against that child Jesus who grew into adulthood, adulthood with the same message of goodness all around. But a time came when this Jesus was selected by God to represent him and not just goodness. To tell the people around that the goodness Jesus had been talking about must lead to God and must reject all other gods which are related falsely to goodness but they are related only to evil. There the struggle began. Yet the message did not change. The goodness Jesus stood for did not change his character. He pleaded the same things. And what was his message? So kind, so soft, so humanitarian. But he told the society was that if somebody strikes you on one cheek, offer the other one, if you please, if you can. If somebody runs away with a part of your clothing, offer the part which is left behind by him and say, all right, don't forget this much, please take it away as well. Now, what was offensive in this message? Tell me. Whatever was offensive about this message to which the society reacted, there was nothing. Yet it reacted, and very strongly so. Only when the elders of that society realized that this humble message is bound to win, and this humble message is bound to change the ways of the society, and this humble message is bound to create a revolution in the society, where the elders of the society will no longer be the elders, 
the new leadership in the name of God will dwell. It was that conviction that this revolution is bound to take place, which turned the entire society against Jesus Christ. You, Amadi, would be no exception to that. Be ready for it. But only when your conviction in the goodness of God, in the goodness of the, of the Rabbul Alameen, the provide, provident of the whole universe, becomes so strong in your, so strong that it becomes evident to the rest of the world. Convictions can be of two types. One type of conviction is subjective. Anybody could be convinced that this is the right path which I am pursuing. This is his subjective experience. But when this conviction is seen from outside, when people around begin to notice that this conviction is going to, be, is going to become contagious in the society, is going to spread. That is the moment when they turn against such conviction. It becomes objective, not only subjective, as it began with. So the Ahmadis of the United States should be ready for all that future and hasten towards it. They should not shy away from that animosity or hostility because the more they shy away from it, further away it would become. It would run away from you. The hour of change, the hour of revolution, if that revolution is the name of God, must be hastened. At whatever cost it may be. So ready, be ready for every cost every sacrifice, although in the beginning your progress is mild, your progress will be winning friends. People will come to you praising your ways. They say, what a good people Ahmadis are. They're champions of truth. They're champions of goodliness, goodness and godliness. They're champions of everything that our society needs. But they do it just as a lip service, because you will not cross their path. They will do it just as a good service because if they really believed in your goodness, they should have become good themselves. They should have joined you. But they praise you from outside. Like someone praises a, an excellent player of basketball or an excellent player of baseball in America. He claps him, he loves him, he praises him, but when it comes to his own personal efforts in becoming something like him, he would sit back in his own comfort. And most of them are incapable of becoming basketball or baseball players. So they praise you like the clappings of the observers or spectators of games and no more. If you, are, if you won, win, they'll be happy. If you lose, still they'll be happy. Because they're not a partisan in this game. So what I'm driving at is they are not as yet fit fodder for you to be assimilated by you. All that can be really, genuinely assimilated by Ahmadiyyad must have the quality of truth about him. And the quality of truth is what I want you to pursue. But you can't pursue the quality of truth without being true yourself. So there are many pitfalls on the way and many deterrents which you must overcome. To begin with, you must conquer yourself in the area of goodness. This is what Jesus did. This is what all the prophets of Allah do before they are entitled to address the mankind and call them to the path of Allah. But remember, you are following 
as you believe, and you are right, in the best of all the prophets, the greatest of them all, who invites all the mankind to God without discrimination, who is addressed in the Holy Quran as a leader of the, a messenger of, for the whole mankind, a source of blessing for the whole mankind. These are two things which are specifically mentioned about the character of the Holy Founder of Islam. And I take them up particularly because they are related to the subject of my discussion. First of all, he was made universal. If he had any character which was contrary to the universality of man, he would not be chosen by God to become a universal prophet. His own character had to be universal before he could be selected by God as such. And this is exactly what the Holy Quran says about him, about his light. It is a light, la sharqiyatam wa la it is neither of the East nor of the West. It belongs to God and God's light is universal. So that is the first prerequisite for launching a worldwide movement of preaching or a movement confined to America. The basics of the both are the same. The movement has to be universal in its character as the Holy Prophet of Allah, Hazrat Muhammad Rasulullah was defined as a universal prophet. Second, the movement has to be a source of blessing. Like Hazrat Muhammad Rasulullah, the founder of Islam, was described as a source of blessing for all the mankind, not for Arabia alone. So these are two most important impressions you must create. And those impressions must be created not as an artifact, but as a reality. And they, these impressions can only be created by you if they are actually rooted deep in your character. So remove all such differences which create barriers between humans or nations or races, or colors, or creeds. Be common to them all. And when you become common to them all, then you have to, become, have to be a source of blessing. That is the second step. They're not just one and the same thing, because devil, or Satan, or satanic uh, influences are also universal. So universality by itself does not give you the license to preach what you hold. The license can only be given you if your universality has a source of blessing for the people whom you address. So the American Ahmadis must first apply these two criterion to themselves and judge them by whatever the testimony, the, the, the touchstone of truth reveals to them. If they are not worthy of following Hazrat Muhammad Rasulullah on these two criteria, criteria, then they are not worthy of delivering his, his message to the mankind. Now this seems to be a high-flown admonition which doesn't touch you. Let me begin by illustrating this point in a manner that it begins to touch you. If the, you meet another American who is suffering from anything, not just financial loss, but a disease or abandonment by the society, 
or the crime of criminals committed, committed against them, against him. If the moment you come into contact with such a person, you do not begin to suffer yourself for his sake, then you lose the first part of the criteria. You know what Ahadu Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did? As he walked the streets of Mecca and then later in the streets of Medina. Whenever he saw somebody afflicted by calamities or by, even by his own fall, he would stop and would do whatever was possible for him to do to improve his quality. And he suffered for such people. This is the point which has been made clear in the Holy Quran repeatedly in so many verses. The suffering of Muhammad Mustafa for the sake of mankind whom he came to serve. And at times he suffered so much for the ill-doers that God admonished him for that suffering. Or in, in a manner of speaking, it was a great tribute paid to him. Allah addressing him says, Allah, Allah yakunu mu'mineen, falallaka baqun al-saka ala afarihim in lam yuminu bihad al-hadith asafa. So the people who had rejected him, the people who suffered for the crime of rejecting him, he suffered for their suffering so much that God had to tell him to stop it. Enough is enough. Don't destroy yourself for the sake of unworthy people. It was not a criticism, as I told you. It's a sort of tribute, the highest tribute which was ever paid to any prophet of God. It made him realize that God is looking at me, at every feeling which I entertain, and looking at me with love and consideration. He realized that I am suffering for the sake of his servants, his creatures. So he could not be against this. Only he is reminding me that do it, do it with some modesty, moderation. Because the sufferer must not be destroyed for the sake of the unworthy. So that is the first criterion for every Ahmadi in America to which he should apply his own character, his own, uh, I should say, personality, which has been created uh, under the influence of Ahmadiyya. If that personality does not have this distinctive character of suffering for others, then he is not following the path which leads to Allah. And Allah will not care for him if he does not care for his mankind. Allah will not care for him like he cared for Hazrat Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu and his suffering. And without him caring for you, you cannot succeed. Remember this. Love mankind as mankind should be loved. With a genuine motivation, not for the sake of display. And then you will see that God will be on your side, He will be behind you. He will take care of all that the society does to you. This is what He did to Hazrat Muhammad Rasulullah And when then, when, and when the suffering ultimately turns to be a source of blessing for the people for whom you suffered, then your message is bound to emerge victorious because this is what happened to Arabia, and that is what happened to Hazrat Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who started with nothing, just by a single person. And he, before his death, he saw the revolution of Islam overtake Arabia entirely from north to south, from east to west.
I know Arabia had a small population then, but as compared to one, that was Muhammad Rasulullah it was much larger by comparison than the number of population itself could indicate. So if Amazis today in America happen to be 10,000, your ratio with the rest of the society is much smaller in comparison to the ratio which I just pointed out. If one man could conquer Arabia, and if one man was destined to conquer the entire world, why can't you change the ways of Americans to the ways of God? You can, but you must do the same thing which was learned by Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the same manner. So begin to transform yourself. Begin to transform your own wives, your children, O men of America, and begin to transform your men and children, O women of America. And wait with patience and see that yours is not a lost cause. This cause was always victorious. Not only with reference to Hazrat Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but also with reference to all prophets of God. Two things must happen to this holy war must happen by way of consequence of this holy war. Either the people who are addressed by, by godly people in his name and at his command emerge victorious in the sense that Hazrat Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam emerged victorious by completely transforming the nature of society from an idolatrous society to that of a Unitarian society. Or it happened in another way. Those who finally rejected this message of unity of God were wiped out from the face of earth. And the prophets still emerged victorious. That happened in the case of Noah, did it not? It happened in the case of Lot, did it not? Are they just stories in which you believe? Are they fairy tales? Most certainly not. I don't refer to any history to prove the point. I refer to the mankind as such, as stands together witness to the facts to which I'm pointing out. Where are those people today who opposed Noha and where are those who laud them and who proclaim their greatness? But almost the entire world, if not entire, the majority of the world, still lords Noha and the few who were saved by God for the, because they shared the boat, the small boat in which Noha was traveling or Noha was destined to be saved by God. It was Noah whose survival was meant. And those who identified their survival with that of Noah were also saved by Allah. So the history I'm talking about has become a history of the whole world. It does not require writing or written words in support of this, this cause. And the same applies to Abraham. Where is Namrud? There are those opposed to the cause of Abraham. Can you find one man who applauds those who opposed Abraham and his movement? In the entire world, you can't find one. But there are billions of people who call themselves Jews or Christians or Muslims who stand for the greatness of Abraham and his victory. So I'm talking of now, of the contemporary age, the contemporary, contemporary witnesses. I'm not talking of written history. What happened in the struggle between Moses and Pharaoh, 
There are those who would applaud the greatness of pharaohs who are buried deep under the sand of Egypt. You find, you'll find none. Moses did become victorious. He was not just a fiction of history, as some historians would have us believe. Because it is Moses all the way from Judaism to Islam, as li like his, his ancestor Abraham. So this is a history which must prevail, a history which becomes reality. And those apparent realities, which appear to us in contrast of that history which is about to be made, history in often, those realities are turned into nothingness and fairy tales. Those realities which opposed, or the seeds of truth, which opposed the existing realities of the time, they grow into a universal tree. And even the seeds of the evil trees are not to be seen anywhere. Yet they change forms, they change guises. And under different guises, you begin to see the people of Pharaoh again. You begin to see the people who opposed Abraham once again. You begin to see the people who opposed Jesus Christ once again. And also, most tragically I must admit, that you begin to see the people who opposed Muhammad Rasulullah, the last of the Holy Prophets, who ever brought a book for the sake of mankind. Among his own people are those who reject his values. Look at what is happening in any Muslim country or the Muslims living in any foreign, uh, any country which is not Islamic. Can they be visualized as the people who were created by the holiness of Hazrat Muhammad Rasulullah in his time? Were they not unified? Did they not pursue goodness at every cost? Were they not true? But they're not truthful and honest. So where are these values? I'm not talking of the whole world, I'm talking of the world of Islam. So the struggle for the Ahmadis widens into all areas of human occupation, in all areas of religious occupation. Adhere fast to the values which are mentioned in this verse and do not care for animosity against you. Do not care for hostilities unleashed against you. Your safety lies in the values which become the source of hatred for the, for, against you. It is there that your safety lies. It's not a contradiction, it is a reality which can be proved with reference to the history of all the messengers of Allah. To hold fast to the values which ultimately would be, would be the cause of your survival. But in between, a period would come that your pursuance of those values would be the source of hatred for the others against you. So you go forward steadily with perfect faith and belief. But you must yourself be good. <laughs> Let me see my notes. If I have left, I have left anything. It seems that I left most of the things which I have jotted down. <laughs> but even if I put myself across on this issue, I would consider my speech to be purposeful and meaningful, and I would hope that it would be heard with the same uh, sympathetic ears as I expect it to be heard of. 
if the ears are sympathetic, the hearts do become sympathetic. If the ears are not sympathetic, the message does not reach the heart. There is the meaning of the Quranic verses which say that the ears are deafened, they have become heavy. So if the ears reject the message out from outside, the hearts have no way of converting to the message because they would not hear, they would not realize it. So that is why I request you to lend me a sympathetic ear and I won't take long, uh, long, much longer of your time in concluding this part of my address. So the Ahmadis are needed to improve the quality of American life by calling them to the attributes of God. And the attributes of God never split mankind. To our Afro-American brothers, in this regard I have a word to say. There are many movements among the Afro-Americans today which attract the people, unsuspecting American people, to a slogan which they think would ultimately make them unite under that slogan and emerge as victorious in America. This is what is not going to happen. It is not a prophecy. It is an observation based on the past. Every movement of hatred, every movement of revenge, every movement founded on inferiority complex is bound to fail. It would not lead you to any success. So in the name of Afro-Americans themselves, it's highly essential that they must universalize themselves with the attributes of unity. Then the rest of the world may look upon their skins as black, but Allah would look down, look upon their skins as the most shining. Like the skin of Bilal, the Muslim of Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Bilal also belonged to a black race. But the message of Hazrat Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not discriminate against Bilal in the least in any area of human association or treatment of uh, each other. He might have had Bilal in his mind or all the Bilal of the world when during his last sermon he said today this holy day I trampled down under my feet any discrimination, born out of nation, born out of races, born out of geographical boundaries. He said, I trample down under my feet. Arabism against Ajam, Ajamir. No Arab has any reason for applauding his greatness. Because I am Arab, that, is what the, but that was what was implied by Hazrat Muhammad Rasulullah Because I happen to be Arab, so the Arabs are not great. Nor are the Ajams inferior to the Arabs. If anyone had entertained this thought, this is my last, last advice and the last address. And during this I templed down this false notion altogether, forever. Why was Muhammad Rasulullah great? Not because he was an Arab. Because he was great in the sight of Allah for his not belonging to Arabia alone, for his belonging to the whole world. <laughs> so any motive which, is, which generates from inferiority complex will always frustrate, will always end up into nothingness. It will only do damage. So if you love your own people, 
who are Afro American. Remember this. None can change this decree of God. You must rise above parochialness and begin to rebuild yourself under the unity, under the canopy of unity of God. Then you can rise in the sight of all around you, whether they are white or, or red or whatever their color be. Because God must be extolled. And deep inside, the humans ultimately do extol God. They cannot, in the beginning, change their way of life in accordance with the, their basic fundamental urge to extol God because of their selfishness, but this is ultimately what emerges as the victorious factor in the struggle for existence in the religions. So be honest to yourself and tell your brothers to abstain from anything which would split Americans against Americans. Let them hate you if they like. But did not humanity hate the prophets of Allah? Let them hate, if they like. But the hatred would not be made to emerge victorious if you love God. That is the precondition for your victory. Because your victory will not be against humans. Your victory will be against evil, against ugliness of immorality. So I hope and pray that the American Ahmadis would take up the cudgel for this message and tell their brothers all around America to rally round the flag of unity of God. <coughs> That's the only way of their survival. Then they would emerge like Bilal, who was looked down by, Ara by the Arabs as the meanest thing on, in, on the Arabian soil. Because first of all, he was black in his color, and secondly, he was a slave. You know what happened to him? When he sacrificed his personal comforts and risked his life for the sake of unity of God, when he was dragged in the streets of Mecca, in the stony streets of Mecca, like a dog is, is, is dragged with a rope tied down its, its ankle, so was Bilal dragged down. And until his last moment of consciousness, he kept on extolling the unity of God. He almost died saying, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah. Until those who watched him tell us that he could not be heard, the voice was not audible, but the finger was raised in the direction of oneness of God. This was Bilal, who was transformed into a leader. This was Bilal, when he approached the great caliph, Hazrat Umar, he stood up from his seat and said, Sayyid Ma Bilal, Sayyid Ma Bilal. Our Lord, our Master, Bilal has come. So, oh, Bilal of America, you will become the Sayyids of America if you follow that Bilal of Muhammad Rasulullah, his servant, and the servant of the unity of God. Spread this message across and be patient. Convert the society bit by bit, not by your words, but by your example. Allah bless you. And with that, I come to the conclusion of my speech. And I hope, inshallah, next time I come here, you will gain more converts, but not to increase your number. You will gain more con converts, to increase your quality and their quality of life. Allah bless you. And let's join in silent prayer in the end.
آمین السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ I think enough is enough your voices are breaking down Thank you السلام علیکم السلام علیکم لنچ از ریڈی